internet friends. Welcome to another episode of the Synergy Cafe online show featuring speaker, entertainer, close-up illusionist, and marketing alchemist, Magic Brad. It's the internet lifestyle show about career, finance, relationships, spirituality, and wellness. We're moving the online chatter over to real life activity. And now, please welcome your host of Synergy Cafe, Magic Brad. Three, two, one. Hey, internet friends, this is Magic Brad with Synergy Collaborative and the Synergy Cafe show. And today I've got a new friend that I just met from the west side of town or west side of the United States. And his name is Tom and the last name is Cox. How you doing, Tom? Doing great. Thanks, Brad, for having me on. I asked you if it was a Tom or Thomas and you went with the short version. I like that. Those two syllables. It's just too much. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's one of those style questions. <laughs> exactly. People ask me if I want Brad or Bradley and I say magic Brad. That's how you find me. <laughs> there, there you go. Anyways, so you are over on the west side. I think you said the Oregon or Oregon or however you say it. Oregon, yeah, Portland, Oregon. Oregon or just outside of Portland on the west side in the uh, beautiful town of Beaverton. I've been in that area. I've been because uh, there's um, Neil Donald Walsh does some stuff over there. And there's a, I, I helped promote an event. He had a humanities team thing over there. I was helping him promote. And up in the, isn't it Canada? What's up there? My wife really loves that area. Well, of course, Vancouver, Canada. Yeah, 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 yeah. I got to get over just there. Just inside of Washington State, a mere three, four hour drive north. Have you been? I have. In yeah. fact, I threw, flew through Vancouver many times on my way to do a consulting project for the leadership training for a bunch of guys in a, a paper mill way up in the Canadian, uh, I can't remember the name of the town anymore, but it was a, a flight to Vancouver another puddle jumper to a small regional <laughs> airport. And we had to rent a car and drive four hours to get to this plant in the middle of nowhere. Got it. These guys were working 12 <laughs> hour shifts doing this. Really, it's a very, um, if you do it right, it's a very dirty job to, to get in there with the, these pulp uh, machines that okay. make paper. You have to keep the tension just perfect. And the, the leadership challenge that those guys face is the same one you and I face every day. Uh, and that is how do you get somebody else to do what you need them to do, what you want them to do, and when they think maybe they have a better way, or they don't see why you're trying to tell them what to do, uh, or there's something about the way you're asking them, just not turning them on. Well, let's let's get into that, because that's, that's the next question, is what is it that you do? And it sounds like you're kind right. of segueing into it wonderfully. So uh, there, there you have it. I guess it's on my mind. I can't not talk about it. Le leadership, well... I've been an entrepreneur all my life, so I know what you mean. Everything is business. Yeah. Every time I see something that isn't quite optimized right, I think, you know, you guys should move that table over to the right and you'd flow a lot better. <laughs> Why don't you just eat your meal? <laughs> well, I, I got fascinated by leadership years ago, and at first it just looked like chaos. I mean, there's a hundred new books a day that come out on Amazon on the topic of leadership. It's got leadership in the title or in yeah. the subject. And I've read a bunch. Of, I haven't read that many, but I've read a ton, especially anything that's uh, come out in the last even 50 years. It has a good reputation. I, I read the Harvard Business Review blog. Uh, and it's just, it's a, incredible the volume that's come out on this incredibly important topic of leadership. And it's all over the map. And it was tremendously frustrating to me because I want to give guidance to people. Right. But I can't find any guidance that's actually always going to be true or that I can figure out which bits are going to be true for you. And if I can't figure it out, why would you pay me? To help you figure it out. Now, by that, so it was very, by that, very baffling. By that, do you mean that maybe if you're a leader, it may, it's going to be a different kind of vibe if it's a blue collar group versus a suit and tie group versus, uh, you know, passive well, people? Let's or put it this people? way: if I can't fa find something that's universal, then I better find something that I can I can customize to you. And if I can't figure that out, I should get into another line of work entirely. Okay. Because I. I can't just spin, uh, spin platitudes and take money and, and then cash that check in a good conscience. Right. And so much of the leadership literature is platitudes. It's things that are, you, you can't prove it false, but it doesn't tell you what to do. Yeah. I, I challenge you, go, go out to any you know, collection of leadership quotes, read through them, not with the, the ear of, you know, is, does this feel true to me? Because they'll all feel true, but rather... Does this tell me what I should do tomorrow when Sally comes to me and says she can't do the thing I need her to do? Yeah. And what you'll find is the vast majority of it, not only it's not actionable, it doesn't tell you how you can do a better job today and tomorrow. You, you actually can go like, 
what does that really mean in terms of behavior? It's not guidance. And that drove me nuts. So I, I was wandering in the desert, as you can imagine. And it was partway through this, I realized I, we were, we're doing this all wrong, Brad. We're doing it wrong. We're looking at leaders. We're looking up at leaders. We're going, oh, look at the leaders. And think about it. It's every one of those leaders has their own personality. They've all got a unique team, different mm -hmm. from yours and mine. They're facing unique circumstances, probably different from yours and mine. Uh, and in those circumstances, they've got unique challenges, different from yours and mine. That's four variables. Now, even if you take away one and just fix on yourself, take away that who the leader is variable, the other three are always in play. Right. And I was reading a book by John Gleick called Chaos. He said that you can generate chaos with three variables. And there we've got it. So maybe it's unsolvable <laughs> looking at it in this direction. So, well, what else can we do? And I, I ran across the work of uh, Professor Boyatzis out of Case Western University and a woman named uh, Susan Steinbrecher out of San Francisco. And they both pose this question, each in their own way. And it, uh, the way I do it is this. I'll have a room of 100 people. I'll say, hey, who's the best boss you ever had? Everyone goes, oh, yeah, hang on. And they all, probably three quarters of them start smiling. These happy memories come back. And the other quarter are like looking around jealously because they've never really had a very good boss. <laughs> <laughs> and I tell them, well, think about a teacher or a coach you had. And it, well, and some of them can get that. And the rest of them just sit there sadly and have to kind of watch from the sidelines. And then I say, well, okay, so that best boss, uh, write down what they did that was so special. And everyone writes something down. And I say, all right, pair up in twos and threes, share your knowledge, and then we'll share it with the room. And I'm going to be a police forensic sketch artist. I'm going to draw a picture of this best <laughs> boss that like we've all got this one and guess what it's all the same sketch everybody wow. says the exact same thing the chaos is gone they say uh kept me safe uh made me part of the team that mistakes were a chance to learn that uh, i was able to do things i didn't think i could do before my boss saw in me skills i didn't see i had my boss gave me uh stretch assignments uh, and i was scared i did it anyway and it worked uh, my boss mentored me, coached me, believed in me, cared about me as a human being. And they go on and on and on. It's all the same cluster of ideas. Sure. And it falls into two simple buckets, just two things, Brad. It's all you have to do to be somebody's best boss. You have to keep them emotionally safe. And by that, I mean safe to make a mistake, safe to try something new, safe to ask for help, mm -hmm. safe to disagree with the rest of the group if they think the group Come on, might what's be. number two? What's number two? <laughs> <laughs> right? And secondly, is awaken in them a hunger for excellence, in part by not accepting anything less than their best, and in part by pushing them out of their comfort zone into their level of growth. When we all know that growth comes just on the other side of your comfort zone, you can learn inside your comfort zone, but you can only grow outside. Okay. And someone that you like and you trust, who believes in you and cares about you as a human being, who's got positional power, who then pushes you gently but firmly out of your comfort zone. See, this is You will experience that person for the rest of your life as the best boss you ever had and you and I can do that today. See, with this our is... spouses, with our kids, with our uh, I peers. Just, I was just going to ask, do you do you have kids? I do. I have a daughter. She's uh 22 now and just presented me with my first grandchild. Cool. Very exciting. <laughs> so now you get to work that work that end of things, a generation. <laughs> So, cool so what you're talking about is really cool because I'm an advocate of taking out all this stuff, the bottlenecks and the gears that don't turn, just get them out and move yeah. something else. Get as many things out of the way because you're going to the essence of humanity of, and what, because it doesn't matter if a person is blue collar or their suit and tie kind of person, Ooh. they've got that same kind of, I want to be recognized and don't threaten me. I, yeah, I get it. Yeah. That's pretty cool. I like it. And, and what's lovely about this is once you realize it's this simple, you can start to look and say, huh, which of the people who I'm trying to lead is, is like shut down and a little scared right now? Mm -hmm. uh, and or, or who's coasting? Who's really not giving it their best? Who's not growing? Who's, who's so far out of their comfort zone that they're, they're like out of their depth? Who's so far in their comfort zone? They're asleep at the wheel. Right. And, there's a guy named uh, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi years ago wrote a book called Flow. And if you've ever been in, in a I flow or in the zone experience, yep. you know it's euphoric, it's wonderful, it's your most productive time. And it's in that balance where it's not so easy, it's boring, 
and it's not so hard that you're frustrated, but you do have to bring your full attention to it. Kind of like doing live uh, interviews, right? It, you, you know this is live, so you, there's a little bit of an edge to it, yeah? Mm -hmm. And a good boss is constantly putting their, their followers, their direct reports, as close to flow as they can, which means they're maximally productive. So now you know I'm supposed to be putting these people into flow. I'm supposed to keep them safe. I'm supposed to make them grow. And that's all I have to do. So, so I can now customize what I do to each person who follows me. So when someone is in that flow, they're not feeling threatened and walking on eggshells and stuff so they can move forward no, and get alert. things done. They're focused. Got it. They're, so, they're, they're really paying attention. So this is and all really... actually in their greatest growth mode as well this, as the greatest performance. This is a very interesting approach because I like how you're whittling away all this stuff to find the, the Adonis-type sculpture inside all the granite. You know what I mean? <laughs> Take away everything that's not Get Adonis. All that. Exactly. So that's very cool. Um, I'm assuming that you might give somebody a little bit of a taste of what you do with some kind of complimentary conversation before you run their credit card or anything like that. Absolutely, yeah. I've got a, a uh, two different self-evaluations you can do. One is, uh, well, let me, let me describe the, the system. It's simply four levels that I walk people through. Uh, the, the fourth level, of course, is how to demand excellence. It's the last thing you do. The third level is how do you build loyalty and really get people to trust you legitimately because you're trustworthy, because you're, you're keeping them safe. So layer three is about loyalty. Layer two, I, I thought that was just the system. I keep, keep them safe and make them grow would be it. But it realized I had to add two more layers. Mm -hmm. because I didn't want my system falling into the hands of unscrupulous sociopaths who would just use them as manipulation techniques. <laughs> okay. um, now, honestly, if someone keeps me safe and makes me grow, there's a part of me that doesn't care really like why they're doing it or how they're, as long as they're doing it, I'm still happy. But still, as the, as the instructor, I can't afford to have my system tainted by someone who's really not legitimately caring. So I added two more layers, underneath excellence and underneath loyalty. Layer two is emotional intelligence. And layer one is kind of the Peter Drucker layer. It's how do you just make sure you're showing up on time, prepared, time management, task management, efficiency, and effectiveness. So uh, you have two self-evaluations. You can pick one. One is just the level one, knowing yourself. It's just the Peter Drucker layer, I call that. And that self-evaluation is available right away. And I can send that link along and you can post it if you'd like. Okay. Love to have people fill that out. Um, well, and the other one's more of a comprehensive one for folks who really are in leadership and want a full four-layer self-evaluation. Well, before we get into my favorite why question, um, why don't mm. you share how we can get a hold of you? Do you have a easy to remember a domain name or a website or something? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, my name's Tom and my website's tomonleadership.com. Oh, cool. Tomonleadership.com. Tom on leadership. Perfect. Well, I will also put that in with uh, all the stuff I propagate out so they can just get directly to you via a click. But here's my favorite question, and then we'll sign off. And if you want to hang out, we'll chat a little bit further. Um, it's the big why question. Why are you right. doing this? Why aren't you like a uh, professor at a university teaching? Well, any uh, of the other many things <laughs> that one can do in life, right? Yes. I mean, we're not ants. We're not specialized. We're all of us pretty flexible. Yeah, why are you doing what you're doing? I, I love that question. Uh, I almost didn't. Because in 2005, I had this moment where I, I was a, an executive, an interim executive, and, and I had a really bad experience where I, I harmed my relationship with a follower by doing something stupid and manipulative that on reflection I should never have done. But in the moment, I didn't somehow have anything better available to me. I almost stopped entirely and, and switched out of leadership consulting. And I thought, well, wait, if I haven't got a system Nobody does, because I've been looking, and there's a, if I need this, a lot of people need this. And I thought of all the workers out there who've got medium to poor bosses. Think of all the poor bosses you've had in your life, or your friends have had, or have right now. I've never had one. Thank goodness for you. <laughs> and then you think about the poor, you know, the poor schlub who was a good frontline worker, and they said, "Hey, you're good at this job. You can be a supervisor." Totally unprepared. He goes in. He's terrible at it. At some level, he's got to know it. His former peers kind of start hating him because he's just not a good leader. But no one gave him the tools to do it better. Okay. So we've got all this, I call it optional misery. Misery no one needs to go through. The, the boss hates it. The workers hate it. No one's happy. No one's productive. And the people who put him in this position of power, they haven't got any, 
they don't know what to do. It's like, well, I guess he didn't work out as a manager. And the failure rate for first-time managers is close to 90%. So and it's appalling. You haven't really said it directly, but I'm getting the why that I you want to help those people. I hate that kind of waste. I hate the misery so that wanted... workers go through when they've got bad bosses. And I hate the, <laughs> the horrible feeling that has to come on anyone who's self-aware, who knows deep down they're not being a very good boss to at least some other people. It's completely optional. Everyone deserves a best boss. Okay, so you're trying to create a movement, if you will. Instead of I want to, a, I want to raise the bar. Instead of a boss, they're more of a a leader or a inspirational mentor. Yeah, that, that, that leader, <laughs> coach, uh, the person who really cares about you as a human being and is committed to your personal growth and your happiness in your role. Got it. Well, Tom, I appreciate you taking the time. It's good to get to know you because... Uh, I didn't before, but now I do. So we can hang out like, and talk a little bit you. more. But I'm going to sign this one off. Thanks for spending some of your day at Synergy Cafe with the Synergy Collaborative. This is Magic Brad signing off. Thanks again, Tom. Appreciate it. Thank you.